Martin Griffiths has urged the international community not to ignore the devastating drought in East Africa. According to the UN, 20 million people in the region are at risk of severe hunger. India banned wheat exports on Saturday as a scorching heat wave slashed output and domestic prices hit a record high. Fertilizers that we paid between 150 and 200 euros per ton a year ago now are at 800 euros. It is a cost that is absolutely exorbitant. And on top of that, there is a shortage. The war in Ukraine has come just as the world is being threatened by a global food supply crisis. When the earth is bled, and the crops will not grow, then all will fall to ash. The truth of this simple observation can be seen at every turn of human history, forgotten when the fruit of the land is in plenty, and then brutally remembered as hunger's painful barbs snare. Famine is an old evil, and it has raised many grand halls to ruin. With this in mind, it is clear that we do not speak lightly when we say that capitalism, today, is in the early hours of the most profound food crisis in human history. The pangs are already evident, as is always the case in this world of empire. They are felt most profoundly in oppressed nations. In Somalia, Ethiopia and Kenya, one person dies of hunger a minute. With agricultural collapse in motion due to four years of drought and rampant fertilizer costs, this reality threatens to bloom into an all-consuming catastrophe. Over 20 million are threatened with starvation by September. In Sri Lanka, lower crop yields due to a ban on fertilizer put in place in response to rising prices in 2021, have brought the country to its knees, seeing a rise in food prices of 46.6% between April 2021 and 2022, and the nation default on its debt. Even within the centres of imperialist power, the reality of the food crisis is becoming known. Inflation at highs not seen in 40 years in the United States and Europe, driven by record-breaking food and energy price increases. Agriculture, in particularly Europe, faces total breakdown, with the majority of farmers already skirting bankruptcy, and the continent's largest producers of industrial fertilizers cutting production drastically. Globally, the UN predicts that the number of people facing food shortages could increase by around 47 million over the course of just this year and that the crisis itself is expected to last years. Whilst many bourgeois pundits attempt to blame this crisis exclusively upon the war in Ukraine, either upon Russia's invasion or the sanctions launched against it, depending upon their preferred flavour of apologism. In reality, this is but a catalyst to a far, far deeper problem. Today, Capitalism is not only becoming increasingly incapable of producing food, it is destroying the basis for the production of food per se. This is the inevitable result of the working of its inner laws, the ceaseless compulsion they give to the desecration of our planet and the crises these processes breed. Juhara Ali lost all her cows due to the drought. She has no food for her four-year-old daughter. My daughter is getting worse every day. She can't keep anything down and is vomiting. I tried to give her tea and powdered milk, but she gets diarrhea straight away. I can't put him down to rest because he's sick. But since last night, swelling and fever have gone down. 
When we lost our livestock, we lost our minds. We can't live without our livestock. It is worsening, worse than it has ever been. That's why you can see signs of starvation and true hunger here. In the first volume of Capital, Marx observed that all progress in capitalist agriculture is a progress in the art, not only of robbing the worker, but of robbing the soil. And that every method by which capitalism has increased the short-term fertility of the soil is a progress toward ruining the more long-lasting sources of that fertility. This is particularly important in the case of nitrogen, vital for soil health and crop growth, but only gathered by legumes in nature. The guano fertilizer industry, established in 1824 and grown to a mass industry, fundamental for capitalist agriculture's nitrogen supply by the 1850s, elegantly illustrates Marx's observation. The first high quality guano reserves subjected to capitalist exploitation were depleted by 1870, just three years after Capital's publication. After a century of warring and competition for island deposits of the material, which is composed of bird and bat excrement, the last guano reserves were exhausted in the 1970s. The short-term gains of increased fertility for the farming of cash crops had consumed its basis. Not only this, they saw agricultural practices shift away from the traditional methods which had previously sustained food production to nutrient application, requiring new forms of nitrogen fertilizer to sustain food production. Industrial ammonia fertilizers, produced from natural gas stock, first brought to the market in 1929 by Shell, provided the answer. This set the stage for the contradictions observed so far to play out at an increasingly elevated level and for the broader contradictions of capitalist overaccumulation to assert themselves directly in the composition of agricultural capital. From the 1960s, industrial production of ammonia fertilizer ballooned and global agriculture output grew enormously. However, to sustain this required an exponential increase in fertilizer. For example, Across Asia, fertilizer use grew between 3 and 40 times faster than agricultural output through the 1980s. In both industrialized imperialist nations and oppressed nations, this process prevented a return to older forms of agriculture, further eliminating traditional methods of soil maintenance, even simple crop rotations, increasingly concentrating land in large-scale farms or under monopolies, and draining the soil's long-term fertility. It also served to raise the ratio of capital invested in agricultural means of production relative to labour power, thus lowering profitability, and to tie agriculture directly to cheap gas production. 80% of the productive input for ammonia fertilisers today still derived from natural gas. With the energy crisis of 2021 sending gas prices skyrocketing, this situation was given an explosive catalyst. Fertiliser prices cascading far beyond the limits of profitability. With increasingly capital and resource intensive extraction and refining techniques necessitated by greater reliance on non-conventional fossil fuels and new gas reserves, cheap gas prices are not going to return. Global capitalist agriculture has fallen into an epochal collapse. Capitalism is not only destroying its own capacity to create food, nor simply depleting soils for future generations. It is ending the environmental conditions which have allowed for agricultural production per se. The entire history of human agriculture 
indeed, of organised human labour in any sense, has taken place within around 11,500 years of climactic stability. This is the only period of such stability within the last 110,000 years. Today, this period is rapidly ending, driven by capital's need for insatiable consumption of natural resources and particularly fossil fuels, emissions still rising exponentially despite their clearly disastrous impact. This year, the consequences of this process for global food production have become apocalyptically evident. Drought stalks the globe. The worst water shortages in their history racking the Horn of Africa and the southwestern US, and severe drought cascading through Italy, France, Canada, India and more. Whole lakes evaporate in Chile, and drowned city ruins surface in Iraq. The implications for crops are staggering. A near total collapse of East African agriculture expected, and outputs in the US expected to plummet, up to three quarters of fields in the southwest expected to stay dry and grow nothing. It is estimated that 75% of the world will face conditions of drought by 2050. Something which has already prompted Wall Street to open a water futures market. Even if a solution to this water crisis wrought by extreme temperature is found, the heat shall still stifle the crops. A June 2022 study showing that heat can suffocate pollen and prevent fertilization in many key crops, including canola, corn, peanuts and rice. Meat production will fare worse still, livestock already dying en masse from heat stroke and thirst, millions of cattle lost this summer. The accumulated weight of capitalism's entire history, its endless bleeding of our earth, its fires which thunder without pause. This is sweeping away the environmental basis of all human civilization. The earth is bled and the crops are limping, withered and wrinkled in the aching sun. All is falling to ash. Whilst claims that the encroaching food crisis is the straightforward result of either the war in Ukraine, as paraded in the Western media, or sanctions, as is claimed by the Russian Federation, are evident fallacies. The war is illustrative of one way in which the food crisis is shaping and shaped by the broader processes of capitalist decline. Put bluntly, food is an increasingly competitive and scarce strategic resource, and the implications of this are already playing out in Ukraine. The world's second largest exporter of barley, fourth largest exporter of corn, and fifth largest exporter of wheat. Much of this agricultural production is concentrated in the east of Ukraine, where Russia's invasion is targeted. Alongside energy markets and gas reserves, it represents a key pivot of the struggle between Russian, European and American imperialists in Ukraine. However, the war to achieve this redivision of resources and markets has served as a catalyst to the global food crisis, not only stopping Ukrainian agricultural exports in their tracks due to both Ukraine and Russia blocking export routes, but also causing damages of around $4.3 billion to Ukrainian agricultural production in unharvested crops, land left unplanted, and destruction of reserves or equipment. This paints a poor picture for any post-war harvests, even should an unlikely settlement come to pass. Whilst the root of the food crisis rests in the laws of capitalist accumulation, the structures and history of capitalist agriculture and the environmental crisis, the manner 
in which a capitalism in crisis reacts to these processes can only provide them a further catalyst. This is evident not only in war, which forms its most extreme expression, but also in a growing protectionism of food products. With India's banning of the export of wheat on the 14th of May, setting in motion a wave of food export bans globally. It is also clear that the food crisis is set to drastically deepen the broader breakdown of capitalism, with, for example, the Sri Lankan debt default hinting at a wave of similar defaults, masses of the oppressed world financially reliant upon the export of food commodities. Capitalism has no way out and may only react with ever-deepening hoarding and violence. If it is not uprooted wholly, it shall leave only blasted earth. In 1899, the Irish communist James Connolly wrote that the seat of progress and source of revolution is not in the brain, but in the stomach. We would do well to heed his words. The deprivation, misery and starvation capitalism stands to unleash upon humanity will provoke a broad and deep resistance. It is here, on this ground, that our class, broken by the fall of Soviet socialism and the defeats dealt to it since, may truly stand a chance of reconstituting itself as a real force. Famine is an old evil, and it has raised many grand halls to ruin. If we are to ensure that it may not only raise these halls, but replace them with those of the masses and their liberation, then we must make plain that all is not lost. Though they are suffocated by capitalism, there are solutions. Combined with careful state planning and mass democracy, knowledge sharing and labour mobilisations, regenerative agriculture may provide the basis for the restoration of our earth and the construction of the communist world. The crisis today in motion will play out differently over the globe, advancing and retreating, shifting its form over the coming months, years and decades. But this is the essence of what is needed. If we are steadfast, illustrating that the case for communism is the case for bread, and everywhere standing alongside the rising clamour of starved stomachs, we stand more than a chance. The earth is bled, and the crops will not grow. Let us rise from the ash. <laughs>